Okay, I've introduced myself once again. I'm Lars from Betacom. Everyone here should know Wolfgang from Exist Solutions. We are happy to announce that we are for yeah, a year now in a very tight cooperation working together to ensure our products Exist Solution, Exist DB and Betaform stay open source and are developed as much as possible. And today we want to show you some hands-off demo what Exist 2.0 can do, especially together with better form in the later part. And yeah, the title is We Fought the Law. Uh, we will explain in a second how it came to this. So the story. Uh, our motivation was we wanted to do a presentation today together. And we both like open data a lot. So we looked around what we have in Germany regarding open data. And yeah, it doesn't look that good, to be honest. Uh, especially if you look on the federal law. And, but there are some good news. And the German Ministry of Justice published like at about 1,500 books of law in XML, <coughs> and you can imagine we were very happy, and yeah, so that's what we did. We took that XML and said, now let's write an application, and since we both work a lot in XML product, uh, projects, we wanted to point out some common pitfalls you usually have if you try to create a big application. So yeah, let's start, let's query some law. Yeah, the first thing we noticed, XML is not always XML. Uh, it was just flat. So there were, um, you had paragraphs and articles and everything, but everything was simply flat, uh, which turned out to become a problem. There were lots of IDs, but they wouldn't match anything. So they were kind of useless for us. In the end, we found out that there was a kind of a system you can see here. Uh, I can give you now one minute and you tell me what it does, but okay. Um, so this is chapter one. Zero to zero would be chapter two. And this is chapter three. So we did some string matching. Uh, this, uh, divided the string links by three and then try to find out in which chapter we are. And the nice thing is a paragraph of the German law can be in chapter, in section one, or 1.1.5 or something. So there's absolutely no rule where you find the paragraphs or the introduction or this or that. And they don't even have any key <coughs> keywords for that, except from the title. You get the title, you get the name of the law, that's easy. But and from the moment on, you want to get paragraph five of our civil law, yeah, you run into problems. <coughs> so in the end, what we did, we uh, took our beloved tools, XSIT and XCurry, did some pre-processing, and transformed everything into a TEI. And yeah, from that moment on, things looked a little bit better. And then we defined our goal, and that's the point where Wolfgang is going to overtake. Okay, um, so Lars is going uh, to show you some really nifty things you can do with, with X forms and uh, this data. Um, but to prepare for that, we have to step back a bit and um, look at how to organize an application like this. And <coughs> our goals in this respect was to have throughout the application um, a clean separation of concerns. So um, our HTML views uh, should be cleanly separated from our application logic, which is an XQuery. Um, 
and that should be separated from the data for sure, from the model behind it. Uh, we do that because we both often work in larger projects where you have um, a team of people and everyone in that team usually has his strength, so they are web designers and uh, people writing JavaScript stuff and other people doing the XQuery stuff in the background. So we want to have a clean separation of that. And certainly in the end, this all makes it easier to maintain an application. So let's look at a, at a few first. <coughs> but yeah, before we start, maybe you should just get an impression of what our final application, at least the, the, the simple part, uh, Lars is going to do the, the nifty complex part later on. <laughs> um, what the simple part will look like. Let's see, it's the second one. Second one, okay. <coughs> so, it looks a bit like Google right now, and uh, for sure we can now search for something, but it has to be in German, but let's try, for example, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so here you <coughs> get your links into uh, German laws, um, everything about beer. So as you see, there, there are at least 16 matches. Um, let's just try one, and here you can read what uh, this uh, particular law, which is uh, a regulation about the uh, allowance of uh, additives in uh, <laughs> yeah additives in uh, fruit and so on. So okay, so if you search for those things, you find quite a lot of interesting. Um, stuff which you would have never thought uh, is regulated by some law, but yeah, it's true. Okay, so this is the simple version. This is just based on, on XQuery, okay? And um, as I said, Lars will later do the more interesting stuff, but we have to first understand some basics behind it. So let's go back to the presentation. Some mark, just a microphone. Yeah. Um, so we said we want to separate uh, view and application logic. Well, let's look at the view part first. Um, the idea, and you will find this in all those little XSDB 2.0 apps which have been released yesterday, um, it's always the same structure, okay? So the idea is to generate as little HTML from our X query as possible, because yeah, we <coughs> want our uh, web design gurus to be able to work on our HTML without being annoyed by this silly X query stuff in between. <laughs> um, okay, where should the application log logic go? Sure, X query module functions. And um, somehow we, we also want to pass um, template parameters uh, into our functions. So there has to be some interface between <coughs> HTML and XQuery. Yeah, so how to connect HTML and XQuery? Well, two approaches. <coughs> the first one, which I did uh, quite a while ago, um, was inspired by, what was it, Scala Lift, I think, um, had this first, so I found it there. Um, this uses class attributes to encode um, template calls. Uh, so you see those things here like app hit count, which presumably returns um, how many hits were found in the search. You have this app search, or you have things like templates form control, which does something. And you will also recognize that this is only a diff, whereas our page looks much more well. There's a page structure around it, the layout and everything that's done by this template surround call here, which pulls in the main uh, page layout. Okay, so that's approach one. But now we have HTML5, and there's actually an H H HTML5 compliant approach as well, which would be to pack those things into data attributes. Okay, so every, um, well, the, the 
the basic idea re remains the same. The browser or an HTML tool will not be buffered by those um, attributes. It will normally just ignore it and be happy. Um, that was our goal. So uh, our web designers should be able to look at that HTML and get an impression of what the output will look like and work with it in their tools and, and do the styling and design and everything um, with, without knowing that actually there's big screen behind. Okay, so that's the, the notation for our HTML views. And now to part two, um, the application logic, which is written in big square. Yeah, so the basic idea <coughs> is to somehow map such a template call to a function in, in an X3 module, okay? And here's um, the, the actual, uh, actual code for this app discount, yeah? So what it does here is it just inserts the number of, of matches found um, or our query um, into this band, yeah? If you look at the function, it's, it's rather simple. Um, it just returns, and we'll, we'll understand that later on, it just returns a count. Um, what is important at this point is the naming convention, okay? So um, the templating framework built into exist recognizes the templating function by looking at the, at the name, and whenever a name matches this prefix local name pattern, it will try to match it uh, to map it to a function it, it knows, okay? How it knows the functions <coughs> is, is a different question. We will we'll look at that as well, but uh, it's, it's not that difficult to see, actually. So the, the magic in the templating somehow maps this uh, data template attribute or a class attribute with the same content to add hit count, our function. Yeah, as I, as I already said, uh, the templating framework um, searches all the modules it, it, it knows, so you have to register them somehow, um, in fact, just by importing them. Um, it knows how to, um, well, it, it searches all the known modules for functions matching our app hit count. Um, that's all heavily based on x three higher order function, functions and would not be possible without that feature, okay? So at least not with adding lots of Java extension stuff. So all this has been written in X3, by the way. So there's no, no Java code involved at all. And there are only, I think, uh, two existdb specific functions used by the whole templating. Um, yeah, okay, so every, every function which uh, could be used as a template needs to take two default parameters but it might, may actually take uh, more. You'll see that in a second. Yeah, let's go back to the, to the function signature of our function. So um, as you see, it has those two default parameters and they are always the same. So every templating function has to have those two parameters, otherwise the framework won't recognize it as a templating function. The first parameter simply contains the HTML element um, which has triggered the, the template call. So if we just go back for a second to the, to the HTML, then the element at this point is <coughs> simply a span. So that's, that's not very interesting, but there are more complex uses um, where it's really um, necessary to, to parse that element which triggered the template. So the HTML node, uh, is passed in. Um, if you are in, more into JavaScript programming, then uh, you could say that our node is somehow uh, equivalent to using inner HTML in, in a JavaScript, okay? So it contains um, every, the, the whole uh, tree which is currently being processed. And then there's this strange um, variable called model. Um, yeah, so this is, the, the, the difficult part, um, because it has something to do with how we actually pass that data around within our HTML template. 
And that's where dollar model um, plays a role because dollar model can be used to pass information from one template store to the next. Okay, but we'll see that in, in a real example. Okay, um, concerning the return value of, of our templating function. So it may either return for sure an empty sequence. <coughs> it may also return a sequence of nodes or atomic values. So in the previous example, um, it returns a count, so what we get back is an integer. So we have an atomic value. Um, or as third alternative, a function, a templating function may return a map. Um, for the first two cases, empty sequence or sequence of, of nodes or atomic values, um, the framework will simply replace the current HTML content with whatever came back from the function. Easy enough. Yeah. If the function returns a map, then processing works a bit differently. You'll see that in a minute. But for now, it's uh, easy to see that um, since the function returns just a number, this number will replace the span element which triggered the processing. Okay, if the function returns a map, then the processing gets a bit more complex. So the, the, the framework checks the, the type of the return value. And if it sees, okay, it's a map, then it proceeds differently and does just um, process all the in enclosed HTML in the current element. Okay? So that's a bit like uh, using apply templates in XSLT. Um, if you return a map, then you tell the templating framework, please continue processing my contents. As simple as that. Which means that you can have nested template calls and we see an example. Now, how to use the model? We saw it already in this one templating function. Well, the, the, the model is a map because I think maps are not standard x gray, okay? But um, I really like them. Um, XSDB implements the, the, the proposal uh, done by Michael K uh, a while ago. And um, until I saw Michael's proposal, I was a bit skeptical about maps in XQuery because I thought they could be abused uh, to, to get around the functional paradigm. Um, but since uh, I read his proposal where he really deals with that, um, I'm convinced that it's a, it's a, it's a very useful feature. Um, so a map just has the advantage that you can put arbitrary key value pairs into it. And in this case, <coughs> we assume that some template in the page, an outer template, has put something called result into our model. Okay. And we just um, know that this is the result we are currently processing and we count the number of items in it. And that's it. So, simple enough. How is the model populated? If we look at another function which actually loads the TI document, okay. so all it does is um, it creates a new map and this new map is then merged into the current map by the framework once it is returned. And in this map, we have one key document and we fill this with, we map this to a value and the value is just our TI document. And the lookup is done by an ID parameter. Um, so that should be easy to understand. But the, the question you may now have is, where does the ID come from? Yeah. Um, uh, so the, the basic idea behind the whole templating is that uh, I wanted to use conventions instead of um, yeah, defining strict rules unless they are really needed. Okay. So, and I think for, for this use case, um, convention does, does really work best. So concerning this ID variable, this ID parameter, um, the framework simply tries to make a best guess about how to 
fill this parameter in. Um, and this works as follows. Um, the framework, when it encounters this additional ID parameter, will first search the HTTP request parameters, and if it finds an ID in there, okay, take it. If there's no ID in the request, then we'll check the, the session, because, okay, sometimes you want to store, um, well, to cache query results in the session. <coughs> and then uh, you may want to take your parameter from a session. So the, the second step would be to check the session. And finally, if none of the, the first two um, applies, we uh, check for static template parameters, which are also possible. So you saw them on the very first slide where we had this uh, template surround with um, add and so on. So those were parameters. And there's automatic type conversion. So if you define that ID as an integer, then it will, the framework will automatically try to convert it to an integer. Um, certainly errors could happen during that conversion, but you have to um, <coughs> take care of that yourself. Um, so that's, that's the whole parameter injection idea. And um, what I wanted to achieve was when, whenever I wrote X queries, okay, I mostly had um, one main query, which did lots of request, get parameter, session, get attribute, um, and so on. And that was a bit annoying um, because you, you have to write, I don't know, 10 lines of code, um, which are actually not necessary. Um, with parameter injection, I don't do that anymore. Um, it just works automatically. And I just add my parameters to the function. So let's look at the, the real search function, which is, which is certainly more complex. But um, now you have some basics. Uh, you may be able to understand it. Um, so it takes two parameters, the query as a string, and something called cached. Okay. Um, the query for sure is the query string the user entered. And then we'll either do a query here, or if cached was set, we just return the cached result. And then we put that into, into the, our map and return it. And um, we'll also set the session attribute cached here to the current result. So what happens is just that when, when the user enters a new query, then it will process, be processed and we'll do this um, query on our TI documents. Um, if the user just browses to the next page, then uh, our query will not be set, um, but we pass on this, this cached uh, attribute, which, which is from, from the session. So we can take the next page. And then this, this whole template um, just passes on to uh, process it uh, to its content. So and hold on. I should you know, go to the side for a second, maybe. So if you look at the actual code. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's our search function the one we just saw. And then there's a number <coughs> of sub-templates, also just functions which actually display our search results. Okay, so we have um, app search results which is responsible for doing the actual display, uh, we extract the title, we, we generate a quick uh, keywords in context display for every line which matched, and so on. Okay, and if you look at the the corresponding HTML. <coughs> yeah, you'll see we have our we have our wrong button. <laughs> there is a go up. <coughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, it's still there. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay, we have the call to app search here. 
and obviously what, what happens in there. So that's the, what's in there is the template for um, our, our search procedure, okay? So we have the app hit count here, which outputs how many matches there were. We have this navigation element, which does the um, previous next page navigation. And we have the actual template for search results here, which shows the title and uh, keywords in context. And that all maps to our um, corresponding functions here. Okay. And passing on, um, you may also <laughs> notice this uh, annotation there, templates wrap. Um, so even though I, I tried to do as much by convention as possible, um, there were two cases where I had to define some extra syntactic sugar, and um, x -ray function um, annotations are actually a very good way to do that. So what templates wrap does is it tells the framework that app search um, should not consume the current HTML, but preserve it. So if I, if I remove that, then the output div would disappear because as I said in the beginning, um, the values returned by a function replace the current HTML, okay? So and I, in this case, I don't want that. I want to have the original div preserved and just want to replace its content. So that's what templates wrap triggers. And that's the one of the two annotations I had to introduce. Um, the second annotation is uh, templates default, which allows you to uh, define fallback parameters. I think we use that in a few places. Uh, yeah, Lars uses it quite a lot somewhere. <laughs> somewhere down there. Uh, yeah, here. Okay, so um, since the parameters, um, yeah, okay, actually they're not allowed to be empty here, but Theoretically, they could have a question mark, which means they would be allowed to be empty. Um, and then we would get an error if we try to call that. No, no, ah, the other way around. If it had a question mark, then we would not get an error because it could be empty. But since we here say that the parameter is required, we could get an error if, if the um, HTTP request did not specify that parameter, right? So we have the possibility to pass in the default value using template support. Okay. Yeah, and then there are also some predefined templates uh, in the templating system which are yeah, used throughout. And one uh, which is in particular small but useful is template font control because it solves a problem which appears quite often. Um, so normally, when, when you create an HTML form, you have this problem that when, when the user clicks on the second match, let's just do something um, which returns more. Um, if you have more matches and the user browses to the next page, then, hmm, actually, sorry, it doesn't work here. <laughs> um, because what form control does is it should uh, insert the current um, parameter here again. But I think we have changed that somehow, so I can't demonstrate it. But yeah, theoretically, that's what it does, and all you have to do is um, call that template within your input or select or um, whatever. Okay, yeah, I think that's my part. Yeah, and now it's time to have a look at the more complex stuff you can do with X forms. Yeah, from my perspective, it was just the other way around. So, was did all the thinking stuff, and I was okay. Now I got the TEA data, and what could I probably do with it? And to be honest, it's not that interesting in the first moment. So I asked myself, yeah. Hmm. I, I first of all, I would like to know when which law was published for the first time, because yeah, you can't see that if you have so many laws. So 
I, we have a better form extension, a small one, to draw. Ah, which one did I? We could start with the line chart. So that <coughs> would be render here. That's a very yeah, simple method. It's not that really interesting from the technical point of view. But at least you get some information. So now I can see uh, this was the year where most German laws were published in the last years. Uh, there was this special event in 89. Some of you might remember. Probably has to do with, deal with that. Yeah, but nothing that special here. So I went on. And yeah, because <coughs> one, one short thing. Um, I completely use Wolfgang's template mechanism, as you can see here. It's uh, even the same templating page we use. The only thing I had to do, I had to add the Xforms namespace to the template. That's the whole difference. And then I wrote my own Xforms xQuery module with an expand function. And so I'm parsing, parsing everything beneath this Xforms expand. Uh, xQuery function and generate xforms controls out of HTML, HTML5. And next thing was, okay, yeah, we have this timeline at better, in the better form package. That could be nice. And so we draw a timeline where I can, for sure I come to the same conclusion. Most laws are somewhere around 89, 91. Now I'm at least able to open the law to see what's it, about, what's, it, what's it about and to go into it. And as always, I got a very nice one with hardly nothing in that. This sounds like yeah, air security. OK. So here I simply rely on. Wolfgang's queries, and yeah, nothing special there. So then I thought, now I have to do the same with Wolfdit, and I tried to connect his function with Xforms. So I uh, wrote, took more or less the same template. Uh, we got the input data for the search. We got the submit button. <laughs> here I have a start and an end here, not that special. The interesting thing now is um, I'm generating Xforms of it. M some people of you may know Xforms is not only user interface markup, which is quite easy to, inter to generate an input as an Xforms input, and that does match quite good. But Xforms also has a model containing the instance data with submissions and all that kind of stuff. So what we do here is we say, OK, we have this data refs. So this is our instance data. We simply generate the instance of these data refs. Someone wants to submit something, so we write a default submission if we found something like this. And here we generate the submission. And we say, OK, the result should please go in here. And that's it. We, as you see. I submit the form not to an XQuery, but to an HTML template. That's exactly Wolfgang's template we saw before. This one little change, because Wolfgang's next and previous trigger were simple HTML links, so he, he would load the page every time a new I don't want to do that. I want to use Ajax. So I simply call submit. <coughs> yeah, perhaps we should first have a look at that. Not that amazing. As I said, we have the same input. I can search for beer as well. Uh, here I wrote myself an XQuery to populate the selects with um, data, only the, day, the years where a law was published. It simply doesn't make sense to search for a law in the fixed, fixed uh, 1600, because no, there were no were no law published. So I can say, oh no, let's start to control if everything went OK. We 
search over the whole period. 60 matches, looks good. Let's see what was done in this century. <coughs> ah, only, only one. So now we have a little bit more logic we can use. Um, the selects are generated as well. We can have a short look at me. Oh no. Okay, that's not that good to see for you probably. So for sure now, uh, now we need a little bit more attributes to do, for example, a select. And I'm just trying to format it a little bit better. So in the end, it's again quite easy. <sighs> <laughs> it's really broken. Okay. Uh, we got the start here. And the data ref, show, um, that's where the selected value goes into. But we have to populate the select, that's the data URL. And since this can be any XML as complex as you like, we need to define <coughs> uh, where to start. That's the data item set. So I want to have every codes node from within the data set. And the codes node has an attribute year, and that's a, that is used for the label as well as for the value. And, <coughs> ah, yeah, that's what we could see here. Uh, since the laws don't change, it's not generated on the fly, the year's XML instance data, but once when uh, with the post install task after the XR file was installed. Yes, so good so far. So far, so good. And now we wanted to do something a little bit more complex. Ah, no, this is the template I had to, you've seen from Wolfgang before. The only thing I had to change was to have an application XF simple search. That's where I look if the year is matching, <coughs> and then I have the add pag pagination next trigger to run an XFORMS trigger there. But everything else, it's, it's just the same. So I ended up a little bit, hmm, why use XFORMS at all? I mean, I can use HTML. Controls, they look nice, I can do everything in XQuery, and hmm, no, no real reason so far. It's not that hard to generate the select data directly instead of going over XFORMS. But there's no real sense in that. So, I'll come to that later. Yeah, that's the answer. It's the model. The XFORMS model is really powerful. Um, yeah, the UI, everyone has UI. That's not the big thing. But the model is really something special in XFORMS. And it is because you have complex bindings. You can define constraints, uh, validations, <coughs> relevance, read only. You can have actions in your model, like if this no change, do this and that, and def uh, ex uh, write down this all in a declarative way. You can have submissions and much more nice stuff like uh, schema validation and. So there are good reasons for models, and even for external models. In the former sample, we uh, generated the model, so it was done on the fly, which works out quite nice for simple examples, but now I come to the situation in the project where I don't want my data to be on the client. This happens here. I, every UI control, the, the instance is only created for UI controls, so the data is sent to the client and is present on the client. But for example, a password should never go to the client. We only want to it on the XML on the server. One reason for external models. <coughs> we want to have chain submissions, complex actions, and some fancy nice new stuff from the XFORM side, like multiple constraints, which are already in the 2.0 standard. They are. I think we implemented we have a 
chat after, but... <coughs> oh, sorry. So, this came out then. Like this. <coughs> we have some more advanced options now. Um, we have multiple constraints. So if I look, I want to query beer like this now. You can see I must not use the question mark. If I want to use the star, I'm told no, star is not supported yet. And same is true for the oh, dollar sign. Ah, what, am I, what am I doing here? Yep. If I now take away the question mark, it's gone. So this is something we experience very often in projects. You want very good hints and alerts for the user. Very often you have multiple constraints and it simply doesn't make sense to write something. Sorry, you are either too old, too young, or perhaps this happened and that's the reason why the data is not added. You need multiple constraints here. This works for hints as well as for alerts. So that's a quite nice feature here. And yeah, for sure we can query again. We change, I changed the query a little bit compared to Wolfgang. It's, we still found 16 paragraphs. So there's the 16 again. But now you can see it's, it's, they are found only in this, this six books. And on the right, you can directly jump into the paragraph again. This was all very, very easy to write. The excerpts are all very short. In the end, I can perhaps show you some. So, oh, what happened here? No, my document's gone. One second later. So, this is the search form now. This time we reference an external model, as you can see here. We wow, that's wrong. Okay. Uh, yeah, the rest is more or less the same. This time I call an explicit other submission. We have. Uh, now relevance in here, cause of, let me see. Ah, this is found now. No, here. Here's a group now with a relevance state. So this is simply a group bound to a Boolean value, which ends up, I this, that, yeah. This makes this one appearing and disappearing, which is um, to write something like this in X forms. I don't need to write any line of JavaScript. I simply have my model. code. I simply say, okay, switch the Boolean state and um, yeah, it's relevant if the value in relevance at state is true and if it's not true, it's not relevant and then I simply switch with the set value action this uh, the <laughs> relevance node value and that's it and it works fine. And yeah, here you can see the multiple constraints. That's not the way like the working group has uh, is gonna come up with it now. We have to adjust this. We are going a little bit forward here. And but as you can see, it's quite self-explaining. In the end, the value, uh, the node query, is only valid if all three constraints are valid, if one constraint is not valid, 
it will display the alert, or you can write a hint down there and add the control. So, I think, ah, okay, we can have a very short look in the end at the X -query, X -forms X query module that it sees for all of that. And this is. This is not complete yet. It's more. We, we began to write it. And the people who, are, who know XFORMS are. For them, it's nothing new. We have the XFORMS group, the hint, the input, the label. We have rules that match with HTML templates. And if we find an input, we simply put this input node with Wolf's templating mechanism into that function. And the function generates the XFORMS input of it. And in, in other situations, we were suddenly in XQuery and found out, ah, oh, now I'd like to have an XFORMS control as well. So we did this too. So we have functions like, <coughs> where do I have it? Ah, there we are. Create trigger. So I can call and from within my XQuery the create X XFORMS create trigger function, parameterize it with a map, and it will create a trigger, submissions, whatever you need. So in the end, the idea is to write the model in XFORMS. Because there it's very good to see which instances I use, what are the constraints. Uh, for any data transformations and sending data from there to there, we use XQuery. And the HTML is used for the designers so that they can make look at nice. And yeah, we started using this in projects now. And I think this is something that really works because we always run into problems. We have designed some real big XFORMS applications, and you don't know, yeah, half a year later, you really have problems to understand them. Same with XQuery. I've seen XQuery projects. I had no idea how the markup I see there was generated by these queries. It was simply too complex. And I think this is the right approach, approach that everyone does what he's best at, or she's best at. And bring the words together. And that's what we have. <laughs> Any questions? So we have how much time left? Half an hour. Half an hour. So you should have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or, um, I don't know if Wolfgang has something nice to show. That's a question. Wonderful. Um, well, I think you, se you separate the, the concerns quite good. Um, so you have the HTML programmer, you have the XQuery programmer, but what about the JavaScript programmer? Is we don't need Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need them. No. Um, support him as well. And I would like to have, as JavaScript programmer, I would like to have access to the model, for instance. Is that possible? Because it's all framework. And depends very much on the framework. So we, we got like tons of implementations. Better form is a server side implementation. We are starting to go more and more on the client. And But in the end, it's a server side platform. There are some defined RP calls you can use. But um, the intention is more not to use JavaScript, because XFORMS is doing that for you. You don't need, you can do everything with XFORMS or XQuery. If you, can, if you need to wrap some X, uh, JavaScript around to design something, or like I did the timeline, for example, or the jQuery line chart, um, yeah, there I simply do AJAX calls to get the data. That's it, but nothing. We don't do validations, for example, in JavaScript. There are other XFORMS implementations. I, I haven't seen Alan here today. For example, XSLT forms. Would, this is a client side implementation. There, it would be for sure much easier to integrate with JavaScript. Uh, 
for me, it's always I, I try to use as little JavaScript as possible in our projects because we already have X forms, X query, and other languages. And yeah, it's just not that big focus. You can always, if you use it as not as a user but as a developer, you can always write your own controls in jQuery, <coughs> in sorry, in, X, in JavaScript. Like, yeah, I showed you here that this is a complete JavaScript control, and I only used we used a special appearance on an input field and said, okay, that's a timeline. And what we do is the processor thinks it's an input control, which gets one value. And from the markup, we simply send to the client side, okay, please render a timeline, and then it's rendered. But it's not that we have an, function, uh, an RP-like create XForms input, which you could call from JavaScript. Uh, and I also think the, the, the problem we are coming from is that, well, when you're when you're using XForms, it's really powerful. Okay, and um, I, I like doing stuff in X, in X forms. But um, normally problems start to arise if, if you have to mix it with something else. Like um, there is already some HTML5 because uh, your, your, your customer does already have a, a, a complete web design with some components in it and you can't just throw them out. So you need to mix um, somehow HTML, JavaScript, things written in jQuery, Dojo, I don't know, with um, some X forms in between without confusing people too much. And what I really like about um, the approach Lars has taken, um, so he has kind of hidden the complexity uh, of X forms for simple cases behind simple yeah, HTML5, which is extended on the fly. So people who are not familiar with, with X-Forms won't be scared because that's often the effect you have if people see X-Forms for the first time. They may get a bit scared. <coughs> um, so I, that's, that's the story behind it, I think. Yeah? It's not only about, yeah, one, one good reason. The other reason is I, what I really don't like about X-Forms, I'm writing a simply query search with two input fields and I end up with a markup like this. And in HTML5, it's like three lines of code. <laughs> and I wanted to hide, the, hide this as well, because this is, in a way, part of the complexity. Mm. It's not that hard to understand, but it's just too much text. Mm -hmm. so. Hi. Uh, I was wondering why did you choose to use the uh, HTML5 data attributes and not directly XML elements? Because in the end, I'd like to validate everything. I would really love to be able to run my HTML5 through HTML5 validation. Xforms should be valid as well, and Xquery too. So uh, I don't want it to introduce any foreign attributes there. It's not completely consistent already. That was more a matter of time. And in a, in a way, I understand your concern. I, I'm not completely sure it would be also possible to have something like data minus x forms or beta form and then write your own syntax which you then tokenize for example. But yeah, we, this is something we really have to experiment on now and to find the best solution. Might be that we come up and say, okay, let's do it with our own attributes. We have other issues, for example, if you take the <coughs> Um, complex X forms UI controls, which have child, you, you can't match everything to attributes, it's getting ridiculous at one point. So in the samples I used here, I don't know if it was, I think I did it here already. Yeah, here I mixed it, you can see. So I simply wrote at some point some X forms because I wasn't able to write the XForms X query module um, to the end until today. And yeah, the discussion just start, started. So there will be more to come in the next weeks. 
we had to do one little extension. Some of you might know we came up two years ago with the load and bed mechanism where we um, patched the specification a little bit, the XCOM specification. So we are able to load subforms into an existing <coughs> form at one time because um, it was uh, too static for us, XCOMs. XCOMs and at that point of time thought very much in documents but we are developing enterprise applications, so we need it more dynamic here. And we extended this even more now, so we are now able to pass any kind of XML, and if there's X forms in it, we simply initialize it. If there's a model that fits, fine, we initialize the X forms. If not, the UI control is not relevant. That's the standard makes this clear, and so, we can pass any foreign HTML, XML, whatever, and create XROMS controls of it for an existing model that runs already in the page. Another question, sure. a different matter actually. Uh, you mentioned the external model for XFORM. Uh, does that mean that you have a, in, in the browser is actually talking with the server about the model's data? And yeah. Is that a live connection, like real time, or is it on, on request only? And it's no push. It's only um, so the server, uh, the client sends events if something happens. We have no push yet implemented. We have a customer that wants it, hopefully, because we'd love to do that. And yeah, so at the moment it's only the client triggers something and gets via Ajax the result. And that's it, not the other way around. Uh, one question about the template engine. Um, how would you uh, treat, for example, localization? Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, already, we already did that, actually. Okay. Um, Internationalization was requested by a customer, um, and we, we already wrote a module for that, which is part of the XSDB demo app, so uh, you can get it as, as part of that package. So what we did in this case was to um, implement, I think it's just one, one template function which does all the um, internationalization thing. And there's one example here, that's the, that's the, the main one which calls um, translate on the whole HTML document. And in that document you can have, and that's where you do have a non-HTML markup um, Kobe, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think you did quite a bit of that. No. Um, so that's where we, we do not have, where we do have uh, XML markup within an XML document for the um, I, H, and N uh, tag. Um, it's done with a key value lookup, uh, basically. So there's a translation um, document somewhere. We should get it like written. So that's the that's 
to, to, to Spanish language file and yeah, it looks like you know it from from uh, other implementations like your placeholders and things like that so it can be parameterized. Yeah, and if you look at the demo there, it's a little bit long. <coughs> so it should be rather easy to understand if you look at the source code. So here we have uh, this kind of 18 m translate, um, which takes a parameter, so that's one for the parameter and so on. And here it also is a parameter. So everything is key value based, basically. <coughs> Uh, some form of uh, transformation on the set. Yeah. And the uh, real application you would probably would take some transformation. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 And simply exchange the inputs. Then. Yeah, but so then you would probably have the same uh, problem that is, it is a key value based approach. In a way, yes, but the XML can be as you like because you have the references from the label into the XML at any position you like. <coughs> it's not a flat list like here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 